And today we're talking about a really important project called Let's Yarn About Sleep. So I'm going to introduce um, one of our guests straight away so we can actually um, I'll just stop sharing so I can get my little other screen up. And I wanted to, sorry, sorry, second. I'm, my name is Moira Junger anyway, for those of you who don't know me. I'm the uh, CEO of the Sleep Health Foundation, and we're really happy to present these monthly webinars on a range of topics. Um, and I wanted to introduce Roz, who's a, a Kalkadugan, Kal, Kalkadun woman from Mount Isa, from Mount Isa in northwest Queensland. Um, and Roz has got extensive experience um, with a range of uh, First Nations projects. She's the coordinator of the Australia's First Sleep Health Program for First Nations Youth at the University of Queensland, um, Post Roche Centre for Indigenous Health. So this Let's Yarn About Sleep program that we're going to hear about, um, based in Mount Isa. And Ros is a teacher, a leader, a nurturer, care of children, families and community. She's worked in various roles nationally, statewide and locally, where she's advised on systems and designed and presented um, professional development programs. Roz is also an advocate on human rights, social justice, um, and welfare and rights of children and then Aboriginal peoples. So I wanted to introduce Roz straight away so she can do our acknowledgement of country. So over to you, Roz. Thank you, Maura. I'd like to pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional owners for the land that we meet upon here today. I'd like to acknowledge our elders, both past and present, and our emerging elders as well. I'd like to pay our respects for the people that have gone before us and built the pavements and where we are today as Aboriginal people. And I'd like to acknowledge each and every single one of you here today, from the freshwater country to the saltwater country. I'd like to now open the webinar. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rose. And <clears throat> excuse me. Just going to introduce our other esteemed guests, um, Associate Professor Yakult Fatima. And Fatima is a pharmacist, epidemiologist, a sleep scientist, and the research lead of the Let's Yarn About Sleep program that we're going to hear about. Fatima's research aims to reduce the societal burden of poor sleep and associated health issues through coordinated, multidisciplinary, translational research and co-designed programs and service models. She's nationally recognised for leadership in co-designing sleep health programs, workforce training frameworks and service delivery models to improve sleep health care in First Nations communities. So in response to community identified needs and service gaps, um, Associate Professor Fatima partnered, partnered with community members and service providers to co-develop a ground up sleep health movement known as the Let's Sound About Sleep program. And the partnership discussions were initiated in late 2018 and involved extensive discussion with community elders, key stakeholders from the partner organisations. And I'll hand it over to Fatima to tell us about, give us an update on this research, and then we'll have a time for Q&A at the end. So over to you, Fatima. Thanks so much to both of you for joining us today. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks, Mara. Thanks for inviting us. Hello, everyone. I'm Fatima. Um, and I work with Ross and many other lovely colleagues uh, at UQ and outside UQ on this important piece of work. Uh, just give me one second. I'll start sharing my screen. I've got uh, some slides to cover the program. Uh, right, I need to go up. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. All right, slideshow. All right, uh, before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge the introduction custodians of the land uh, on which we are meeting today uh, in Brisbane, Ms. Jagra and Tribal people, but also the traditional custodians of the various land you all are joining uh, us today. I would like to pay my respect to the uh, elders past, present and emerging, and um, would like to acknowledge uh, the community elders program participant and the broader community who have supported the Lasiana Bar Sleep program and very generously shared their knowledge and learnings with that to shape this program and <clears throat> to help us where we are to help us get where we are. And I also acknowledge any First Nations person, person attending this webinar today. Uh, so as um, as uh, Mara mentioned in the introduction, Let's Stand Up Our Sleep program, which essentially started as a small research project has uh, transformed into a ground up community-led sleep health movement. And um, 
one thing that has stayed on from the very beginning is understanding that how we can integrate two world views, the Western sleep science views and First Nations cultural knowledge on sleep health into uh, designing something that can lead to sleep health improvement in First Nations communities. We work with community members, service providers, young people, their families, and all other broader stakeholders to co-design sleep health program, train and upskill First, uh, First Nations sleep health workforce and primary care health workforce, uh, develop sleep service delivery models that are available in local communities, and more importantly, embedding a sleep health in preventive health care. You can see this um, nice visual representation of the program, uh, the, the values and the principles that guide us. So at the core of everything we do is our effort and our, um, our leadership and advocacy to contribute to sleep health equity. And we know, and there's plenty of evidence that sleep, uh, poor sleep affects physical and mental health, social, social and emotional well-being. But what has not been covered so far in the mainstream literature is the impact of poor sleep on the spiritual health of First Nations people. Uh, through our community consultation, we have identified that in addition to affecting physical and mental health, poor sleep also affects um, the spiritual health of uh, community members for them. Sleep and dreamings are a vehicle and a tool to connect with their ancestors, their culture, uh, their uh, um, other uh, cultural practices. And being uh, very creative and artistic people, dreams are an important opportunity for First Nations people to get ideas and inspirations for their um, for expressing their artist, artistic side. So if they're not sleeping well, they're losing this ability to connect with the culture or get inspirations for their artistic work. And it affects their spiritual health that ultimately affects their physical and mental health. So while Physical and mental health are important. Spiritual health and the impact of poor sleep on these three dimensions is is, is important to consider. Um, we work in partnership with community members and other stakeholders, and the key uh, guiding values that uh, that we work with is similar to any other research project. We uh, we maintain respectful relationship with the stakeholders, truth, reciprocity, integrity, and reflexivity and accountability guides us in all stages of our research design, delivery, and dissemination. We strive for innovation and work with end users in collaboration. Uh, what we have realized um, from, from experiences of other researcher and um, listening to community voices is that we just can't impose any research on community members, we need to understand whether or not uh, the project we would like to explore or the program we would like to develop is important for community. So for any other um, researcher or health service provider who is interested in exploring sleep health research particularly, uh, our suggestion would be to listen to community members and understand whether or not they are ready for that program of research or that service or whether or not this is a priority for community. And then uh, focus on integrating cultural knowledges in whatever you do, be it um, a sleep health model, uh, a program, or any other you know, service you want to offer in the community. And, uh, and be mindful to privilege First Nations voices, strengthen local capacity, and embedding community governance, because that's critical for sustainable changes. We also follow strength-based approaches and build the program and services around uh, the cultural context uh, of First Nations people and focus on local community capacity and knowledge to design programs and solutions. And we hope that by following these guiding values and principle, our initiative and effort for sleep health equity would be successful. We have just started our journey. So as I mentioned before, um, this work started in 2018 as a small project um, funded through the GSU Rising Stars grant, uh, 13K, and from there we have moved to 12 communities in Northwest and Far North Queensland. Our partnership with end users, be it community members and service providers is very critical for us to improve sustainable, uh, to maintain uh, sustainable changes. So we work in partnership with hospital and health services, Aboriginal community control and organizations, First Nations health and wellbeing services, local schools and key advocacy groups. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, that our funding uh, track record is, is good. Um, 
in the past uh, four or five years, we have received over six million in funding from leading funding agencies. And we were also very fortunate that our work has uh, was very well received in, in media. We have over 550 media stories, print uh, stories, TV and radio interviews, and um, they were all um, estimate for the advertising dollar values uh, over 1.2 million, which is amazing. But it also shows that uh, if you work in partnership and users and 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 try to integrate, especially in the context of First Nations research, health research, try to listen to community and work with them. Uh, you will, you will your program, you, will, you can design program that are uh, acceptable to community members and can also be well received, be, be it, uh, the funding or media attention or making uh, sustainable changes in health outcomes of First Nations communities. So, um, the Lesson about Sleep program, we, we offer a suite of sleep health program, but uh, three major projects are listed here. We started with a major project funded to MRFF Indigenous Health Grant in 2020 that focused on sleep health of First Nations teenagers in Mount Isa. And building on that, we uh, received Nishmasi Partnership Grant to focus on first sleep health of First Nations teenagers in six other communities in, in remote Queensland communities. During those consultations, community members um, discussed the need for investing in sleep, um, obstructive sleep apnea diagnosis and management. Currently, there is high rate of undiagnosed and untreated sleep uh, OSA in First Nations communities, but we don't have local services or resources or, or tools to improve OSA diagnosis and management in those communities. So we are current, we have started working on that using the MRFF EMCR grant. Uh, our team, we work with uh, over 50 researchers uh, from over 10 um, Austin universities and partners across different sectors. This is a, a photo of a key uh, team members based at the University of Queensland, while the majority of team is based in Brisbane. We have a strong community presence. Um, we have a community researchers team led by Ross in Mount Isa. We are also recruiting First Nations community researchers and nurses in other locations in, in Cairns and Cooktown. So we have a significant footprint and we try to work in collaboration with local communities by hiring local people, upskilling them and running their program to the leadership of First Nations people. For this webinar, I'm I'm only going to focus on our first pilot project, which is uh, which was focused on sleep health the First Nations teenagers. Here is uh, a photo of our community steering group members. They have been uh, instrumental in the way we have designed and shaped the program. And they were very generous in sharing their cultural knowledge and traditional knowledge with us. Um, so um, in addition to those community members the steering group, we have um, a service providers advisory group and a youth advisory group. These two other advisory group guide us in, uh, in embedding or incorporating the views of other stakeholders in program design and de delivery. So essentially what we are doing is channeling the effort and leadership of community members and other stakeholders for sleep health improvement in First Nations communities. Uh, that um, program for First Nations teenagers started in 2020. In the past three years, we have consulted with over 300 stakeholders and uh, to understand what is community understanding of sleep health and um, to, to explore um, community needs and challenges in their local context to so inform the program design and the design of program resources which are culturally appropriate and engaging for a group of teenagers. Uh, we have consulted with uh, community members representing over 25 traditional groups. Uh, on the left, you can see some photos from our community consultation. So uh, in those community consultation, it was also discussed that in addition to designing the program, we also need to train local people who can run the program. So we have co-developed a sleep post training framework in consultation with uh, mainly community elders. And we have, of course, this co designed the sleep health program, but community members also wanted us to design uh, the program effectiveness 
um, assessment measures based on their views. So they ask us uh, for the success of program, uh, for measuring the success of the program. We need to understand uh, what does the program success means for the community. So as sleep researchers, we always uh, look for improving uh, improvement in sleep duration or sleep hygiene or sleep practices, but that's the end goal. Uh, if you think about a young person living in Mount Isa and expect them to change their sleep, habits and sleep routines based on a sleep education program, that's not going to work. So community members wanted us to embed some other indicators of program success that represent, uh, that are responsive to the local context and um, circumstances of the participants. So we have developed evaluation framework and tools that capture community voices and also allow us to assess program impact at community level. The sleep host training framework, as I mentioned before, was developed in consultation with community MPs. And of course, sleep education is a key component of uh, that training. But elders also wanted us to cover uh, information on other factors that affect sleep health, and for, such as mental health, domestic violence, intergenerational trauma, alcohol and drug abuse. And they said that we need to think about a culturally responsive way that is acceptable to teenagers for running the program and narrative therapy is one such tool which is based on First Nations ways of knowledge transfers like a storytelling method for information sharing and it includes deep listening and understanding and working with each participant individually. So our sleep coaches have received training on narrative therapy and then uh, community elders also shared cultural and traditional information on sleep health, particularly focusing on healing through cultural identity, connections with community, clan and country, dreaming and connections with ancestors. You can see uh, the photos of our sleep coaches on right, Ross, Karen and Makesh, who are currently running the program in Mount Isa. And... Uh, in addition to that sleep coach training, uh, our, our main focus was co-designing the sleep health education pro program. So uh, in this consultation uh, co-design workshop, workshop based on the data that we collected, four major themes emerged, and uh, which were uh, application of strengths-based approaches in program design and delivery. So as I said, the program is based on sleep health education. And of course, a key focus of the program is to improve young people's knowledge around sleep health, how it affects their physical and mental health and why it's important to prioritize their sleep. But elders wanted us to include traditional knowledge in that sleep health information sessions. And they said there is a wealth of knowledge around bush food and bush medicine that can be applied to improve uh, their sleep health, but also to allow young people to connect with their culture and is strengthen their cultural identity. So that's an, a one ma main focus of our uh, sleep health program. And also being responsive to the individual context of different participants. Uh, we can't assume that um, the young people who are coming to our program, they all present with same sort of problems. They have diverse um, problems. They, they, they work from, they, they come from different groups, although all of them are First Nations, but their individual circumstances and family situations is, is very different. We need to understand uh, a person's sleep, health, attitude, knowledge, behavior in the context of where they are, understanding the impact of intergenerational trauma and neighborhood and community level factors that affect a young person's uh, ability to get a good night's sleep. So problem contextualization will also identified as a key factor to consider in program design and of course we can't fix everything through our sleep health program so it was important for us to understand the scope of the work uh, or the, define the scope of our program so our main focus is improving the young people's knowledge and understanding of sleep health and through that potentially improve their behavior and routine but uh, Another important aspect that was covered in those consultations was the role of peer uh, influence and role models in community to be uh, to improve young people's uh, sleep habits and sleep routines. So we, we have embedded that in a program design, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And, uh, and lastly, the stakeholder collaboration, working with families and young people, as well as collaborating with health services to refer young people who have got clinical sleep health issues or mental health sleep issues 
was important. We have combined all that knowledge and learning into our program. And uh, this is the program structure. We uh, start with pre-program yarning uh, and the yarning tools is developed by um, <clears throat> us in consultation with end users. Uh, Ross, Markish and Karen, who are sleep coaches, they screen young people for uh, meeting the program participation criteria. And after that initial yarning, where we are, where they ask questions around their social demographic factors, uh, major life events, the knowledge understanding of sleep health, their mental health, and the individual context. They uh, ask the participant to wear actigraphy watches for seven nights, and also ask them to collect a uh, sleep complete sleep diary for seven nights. After finishing that, the journey with the program starts, and it takes eight to ten weeks to complete that journey. In session one. Uh, we yarn about sleep and we educate the participant on what happens when we sleep, key factors affecting sleep health. And we ask the individuals and the group to come up with uh, a goal that they want to achieve from this program. So individual goal could be something as simple as decluttering their room or not using their phones after 10 o'clock. Uh, a group goal could be uh, people uh, reminding each other to uh, watch sleep health videos, at least three videos a week. And that's where we leverage the uh, the role of peer influence. If this group of young people who have come up with the group's goal for their sleep health improvement, and if they work together as a team, then they are going to be more likely to follow that and attain that goal, as opposed to us telling them that you need to work towards attaining that goal. After a session one, once they have identified the individual and group goals, they go to session two, and there's usually one week gap between each session. Uh, session two is deadly sleep, where we use visual resources for uh, sharing information on sleep health using the felt man and, and the animal cards, and um, the sleep coaches share information on the impact of poor sleep uh, on the different body parts and functioning, and introduce the concept of sleep hygiene, and from there, they go to session three, where again, they build on the previous knowledge from session one and two and understand and discuss common challenges in achieving sleep, uh, sleep, healthy sleep, sleep hygiene, and practical steps for improving their sleep. And each time point, the sleep coaches work with the participant to see where they are in terms of their individual and group goal progress. Session four and five are more focused on connecting with culture and connecting with uh, uh, cultural identity. So in session four, um, which is led by Ross, um, participant go on a walk on country and uh, learn about different bush foods and bush medicine that can be used to improve sleep health. And they spend time on country uh, to improve their cultural connection and also understand how traditional knowledge uh, has helped their ancestors or can help them in improving their sleep health. Session five is uh, Sleep for a Strong Source, where the participant go for, again, um, a walk on country or near the lake or uh, somewhere outdoors to practice this training, which allows them to connect with country. It's an indigenous relaxation technique and that it allows participant to be in a calm headspace before bedtime. Uh, so that covers their journey with the program, but after that, they're invited to talk to us uh, and share their views in, 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 in the yarning session. And then we also collect data on their um, sleep health and routine through actigraphy and sleep diary. So that's what we do in those uh, sessions and pre and post sessions as well. And after that, participants um, are invited to attend a graduation ceremony where they can come with their family and friends, just like a small community level celebration and a key milestone for a participant as well. As I mentioned before, uh, we uh, when we started this program, we didn't have any resources or any tools that can be used uh, in First Nations sleep health context. We have spent a lot of time on co-developing the program tools and resources, the program manuals, uh, the free program yarning tools and sleep diaries and sleep health assessment tools and session activity data sheets and reflections tools. So there's a bunch of tools we have developed, but um, it was important because we didn't want to use any other resource uh, that um, does not capture the concept of sleep health from the perspective of First Nations people. 
So, uh, so far in this program, which is focused on First Nations teenagers in Mount Isa, 33 young people have joined the program, 16 have graduated. Um, since this is uh, quite an extensive commitment from Persip and they need to be with us for at, at least eight to 10 weeks, uh, we were worried that it may, um, uh, we may face problems around dropout, but so far we have maintained over 90% retention. Some percipient who have graduated, they still want to continue working with us and achieving their other goals regarding sleep health. Um, we're not covering sleep health data in this session because there's uh, a session at Sleep Down the conference next month where we'll be offering all that information. But for this webinar, we're just focusing on high level acceptability of the, pro the program. So we ask the participant to rate each session uh, at the end. Uh, we use a three point rating skills and the categories are needs improvement, uh, um, okay, and deadly. For engagement and delivery, over 50% of the participant rated the session engagement and delivery was deadly, and only um, less than 3% said that it needs improvement. Uh, for session content, over 70% rated the session content as deadly. And on the right, you can see some photos from the graduation ceremony and thank you notes written for Ross and Karen, which was quite uh, touching. Mm -hmm. So uh, key learnings from this journey so far is that integration at First Nations traditional knowledge with Western knowledges can facilitate culturally responsive and evidence-based sleep health program, uh, and which is also um, highly acceptable to community members and it, the program initially started as a research but now it's become a community owned thing where we are getting massive support from community members uh, and the turnouts in your community consultations is, is amazing. I think at one point we had over 40 people who turned up and we were worried that we won't, we won't have enough food for everyone, but it shows mm -hmm. that if you listen to community members and work with them and be guided by them they will take ownership and from there things can <clears throat> significantly. So uh, community ownership is uh, in integral for engagement and uptake and just not sleep health program, but any any health program with, uh, for First Nations teenagers or any other population group, it needs to be responsive to participants uh, individual needs and context and should focus on empowering participants to identify goals that can be attained and investing in local capacity and capability is critical for sustainable success. So that's uh, what we have learned so far and that's what we wanted to share today. Thank you. I'll stop sharing and we are happy to take questions. Excellent, thank you so much Fatima for that. Um, really yeah, a good update. I, I always like to hear the updates over, over the, the different in between conferences, et cetera. Um, Yes, yeah, so I was going to say open it up to the floor for questions. And I know that there's a question already from um, Peter. I'm wondering whether usually, Peter, we, we, we um, have a Q&A section you can type it in. Or I think that if you could to, you could try actually just taking yourself off mute, and I'm pretty sure we could hear you if you wanted to do it that way. It's up to you which how you'd like to um, pose the question. So you can yeah put it into the Q&A section. The chat is disabled. Or you can have a go, let us know how it goes with um, taking yourself off mute. See whether we can hear you. But in the meantime, we haven't, we haven't heard yet from Peter. Um, I want maybe while well, we give chance for Peter Chaps to put the put it into the Q&A, because I think that's probably going to be the best way. I'm wondering, Ros, particularly, I heard you speak before about just that, um, obviously, you're really deeply involved with the community engagement and it's very much you know community centered and deep listening and that co-design and getting the getting the community really on board um, and can you tell us a little bit about maybe just a summary of you how you how you see that because I've heard you speak so well about that before um, I suppose the importance I think we can all learn so much about the, the model that you are doing with this First Nations research is, is what we actually need to be doing for in general anyway, like actually um, learning about that. Um, and I'm wondering whether you have any any of the comments of just how you got the strengths or, or how you do it so well or what, what, what whether you, is there room for improvement, um, the, the key principles. 
anything. I think, yeah, I think more, there's always room for improvement with anything that you do. I think one of the things is actually, um, you know, leading that as well and um, being strong and, um, you know, you're identifying with yourself as well because then people believe in that. And mm. I think it's about um, equity. And when you're going out, particularly to community or the community that you're actually living within, it is about a mutual respect of how, you know, nothing less for any people at all. And that's one thing I've always learned. And um, I think around um, it's knowing people will pick up very quickly, especially our people, our Aboriginal people pick up very quickly if it's true or not true. And so the honesty is really important around that. And, um, you know, like I think people do know if you know what you're talking about because it's actually got to be, you know, real and um, people know you from, you know, connections across, you know, the country as well around, you know, when we're talking about traditional ways of knowing and being, it's actually about, you know, um, living that life for real and that is the real life expertise around that. And once you have done that and then... Um, you know, people will pose questions to me at different points of time, but um, if you switched on and you know what you're talking about and you've been there and done that, that is the, you know, main thing. So, you know, I would never talk about something that I would never know about. Um, the respect is mutual, but also it is about, um, and we talk about the deep listening around that, it's um, we can listen with intent, but to deep listen is a very different thing. And one of the things that um, throughout the Let's Yarn About Sleep program is particularly when we're getting the response back from the community groups or we're getting response back from the young people that are the participants in the in the program is always say what people say, write it as they say it. Because when we comprehend that, we can actually then put another curve on it or put another word in, which actually takes the meaning what they're telling um, us um, on board something very different and it's not what the communication is so I think that's something and um, one of the things um, you know I have a lot of connections across the country as well in regards to family and song lines and also around the diversity of Aboriginal particularly um, culture that there is so much diversity and one you know she doesn't fit all and that's something as well so the consultation is something that has to be very respectful um, I always remember that I'm a visitor when I'm moving outside of my own country that I'm a visitor on someone else's country. And it's always like there was um, many years ago, like knock before you enter. So it's always around that. Um, one of the things when, you know, leading a team, it's always because it doesn't happen overnight. I've, it's taken me 25, 30 years to be in this, you know, in a spotlight where, you know, people know you, they know your credibility and it takes a long journey to actually do that work to then know your communities, who are the main contacts within that community, so the hierarchy of community, and to understand that. So there's a lot of underlying that you will never see. It's like when they talk about the iceberg, what's underneath and what's on top. And we talk about that as well. So I think one of the main things is um, I always say it's always about diversity, it's always about equity, but it's always nothing less for Aboriginal people. And I think that's something because somewhere we've always on, been on the bottom of the ladder. And now we're talking about program overviews and when we're talking about um, the work that we're doing as First Nations people, we do know the lay of the land. And I think, um, you know, when we're talking about traditional ways of knowing and being, it's something that has been embedded embedded within us from generation to generations and passed down. Yep. Some yep. might not have had the privilege to actually have that um, journey. I am one of the most privileged person in the world to be a part of the oldest living culture in the world. And um, it's something that I take very, very um, respectfully, but also I hold it deep because one thing I will say that there are some things for everyone to know and there's some things that are left sacred within our own people as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's great. It's a, a, a really good lessons around that mutual respect and you know deep listening and authenticity. That's for sure. Is the things that I, I I take from that. I just got a couple of questions. Well, comments really. There's um, someone has just anonymously said, "Excellent webinar." And will we share the pack post webinar? Thanks so much. I presume maybe the um, Fatima. Would you be happy with a like a, a PDF of the slides? Is that something you would be happy for us to share? Absolutely. And if any of the attendees uh, have any questions and they would like to 
you know, meet with us. Uh, if in Brisbane, we can catch a face to face outside. There's always Teams and Zoom meeting. I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, post webinar as well. And uh, there's so much that needs to be done in this space, and we can't just do everything. So we need many other people to take this program to their respective communities and their um, areas where they are living and start their own version of Let's Turn Up Our Sleep program. And we'll be very happy to uh, share whatever we have to do our journey, our reflections with them. Absolutely. So we'll share um, your details. I mean, the person's asking, can we grab your details? Um, but I think we could just, if you, if we Googled um, uh, Yakult Fatima, University of Queensland, it probably comes up as a public thing, your email address, but we can actually share that as well when we do, when we send the uh, the, the, the details of the slides, etc. And it's interesting, Peter, thank you, Peter, for putting it into the Q&A. Peter has said he's a registered medical designer of a lung physio device that effectively treats sleep apnea manufactured here in Australia and TGA registration is in place and he's, he's of Indigenous heritage and would love to participate. Um Peter says he's a spiritual device as well to claim medically respected, complete with Griffith University study. So it sounds like um, it sounds like Peter would like to connect with you as well, um, Fatima Ross. So that's something we can we can we can facilitate through through this sort of a webinar. I'm wondering that's really great. I think um, I'm wondering any other questions or comments from the people. Actually, there's another. I think there's another one coming in now uh, from Bronwyn. Um, yep, yeah, just saying thank you, which is great. Um, any anything else to add, either Roz or Fatima, from from a, the point of view of, I guess anything we haven't covered, or key challenges, or key new directions, or what you need from us. Like even, I mean, Sleep Health Foundation, of course, are a, a partner with this, and we will be really hoping to help with the dis particular dissemination of findings, um, and we and learning a lot from you know as you know we're trying to create culturally sensitive. Uh, culturally appropriate resources for for people, um, First Nations people about sleep health. But as you say, it's, it's not this sort of it, it's it, 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 it's a very different group. It's like what's what's happening in Mount Isa, or it's across the lifespan, or across different parts of Australia as well. We have to be really aware of that. Um, and we'll just lean in closely to you, like you know, be as you know, we've got the working parties with the ASA and Sleep Health Foundation to to develop good resources for both health professionals and and the, the people. Um, any comments around that or any updates or anything that we should know? Or yeah, I mean, one important, I guess, area um, that has remained unexplored and sleep health in general, especially in First Nations communities, mm -hmm. is highly unexplored under research area. And unfortunately, I mean, despite knowing uh, the high rates of poor mental health and chronic conditions, it's just unacceptable why it has not been addressed before and why someone <laughs> has not done that and there's yeah. a big responsibility for us because if you are doing it for the first time you want to set the right precedent but community elders have been asking us to invest in sleep health of young people because it's easy to form healthy sleep habits in early life then start working with adults and teenagers when it's already formed and established so we are quite interested in exploring sleep health in young people and again not um, imposing more research and communities understanding which communities are ready for that and then uh, you know working on projects which can improve sleep health of young people and then uh, set those healthy sleep habits from from early life so if there's anyone interested in that we'll be very happy to collaborate with them because there's something we have been asked over and over again to consider uh, as one of the key research priorities and I guess one key reflection from me as a non-indigenous researcher working in that space uh, uh, is if you are someone like me who has limited understanding of First Nations culture the willingness to accept that publicly that you don't know much and uh and willingness to sit and listen is is very important patience is critical you just can't go into a community run a research and then come back you need to have deep meaningful connection with people and it for us first two years i don't know how how many meetings we've had just to understand 
what is the meaning of sleep health for people, whether or not they want us to do something in that space, how do they optionalize sleep health, what tools we need to use to assess sleep health. So first two years, and we were quite mindful that we are running a funded project in MRF, was, you know, we, they have their annual reports and all those things that we need to show what progress and then progress in a research world is data and papers, just very different. So finding finding that point where we could convince the funder that whatever we were doing was was actually progress, but not the standard progress as you would define in a research context. So it's it's an evolving area. Uh, patience is key, no matter. If you want to make some sustainable changes, you need to invest time and be willing to work uh, when the community is ready. There are a lot of unfortunate incidents taking place in First Nations communities. We need to respect that if there is um, any death in community, you just need to stop doing any research. We just can't progress with research. So there would be days when you need to respect those cultural protocols and be willing to delay the research or pause the research. Because it takes years and years to form that relationship. And once you have formed, built that, things will be much easier from there rather than rushing everything. So patience yeah. is key. That's and that's good. one thing I have learned, I've become super patient now, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there's some more comments just um, from Bronwyn and Sue just to say thank you. Fantastic presentation, really important topic. And then Sue has that, Sue McCabe has added, um, I wonder if your exploration of sleep health and mental health of this group of young people could include sensory comfort and thermal comfort. These are often myths, yet can underpin both physical and mental health factors that manifest in vulnerable groups. Is that something that's, is that, is that sort of sensory comfort and thermal comfort? Is that something that's come up or, you know, part yeah, of it anyway? Yeah, sensory comfort has, uh, I mean, Rose, Rose is an early yeah. child here, and she has been telling us, like, the way we hold babies and the comfort. Uh, I mean, you can answer that, Rose, and this is something we can uh, definitely incorporate in our next project, but I guess Rose can hand, answer that question better about sensory comfort. Yeah, that's come up a lot, and um, one of the things as an early educator and looking at neurology of the brain with um, young babies, particularly in um, mums, um, pre as well. The sensory is important and that's something that we've actually integrated and we talk about that, the nurturing, because, you know, we've got all different um, various young people that are coming into the program as well, come from all different backgrounds there too. So that nurturing, having that safe environment, but also one of the main things that is a strength-based approach is that um, we're on country. We're out bush. And when we're talking about sensory, about the smell, and we're talking about the touch and the feel, and we're talking about barefoot on country, that's trivial in the work that we're actually doing, um, identifying bush foods and bush medicines. And I tell you, you know, when the young people are tasting the different um, bush foods, they actually then, you know, are quite excited because even though we've got a lot of Aboriginal kids that are doing this program, Somewhere that's missed in some of their lives because all different reasons. So they're having their first taste of the different bush medicines. We're identifying, we're touching, we're looking at the lemon myrtle, you know, we're looking at the tea trees, we're looking at that, but also we're touching and feeling and smelling. And I think when we do the relaxation therapy on country, when you're actually closing your eyes and you're going into that deep relaxation, one of the things that um, the feedback has been from particularly, and, you know, even myself and the young people, that are there, they say they can feel the wind. They can feel the sun on their face, you know, and um, they can smell like a different smell. And, you know, then we explain, well, what do you reckon that would be? Whether it's, you know, whether it's the Gigi, you know, that's blossoming or whether it's actually the gum nuts that the blossoms are coming on that. And then we go into that because it's like a navigator of the country. And we're saying, you know, like, and then there's another and it extends and it can extend even more. So one of the things um, by having that part on country for session four and five, that's, you know, we're talking about all that sensory and connection, that great connection to the mother earth and the great connection to your country to know that this is um, where our ancestors had walked and their footsteps are somewhere. And we could be walking there on that same country as well. 
and we're following that. So, you know, I'm right into that. Um, we're right into introducing other tactiles and we're talking about different things. We've got different tools, different resources, shredding, different beads. You know, all of that is a part of, um, you know, our program. And as well as we're sort of um, the research is being put out there and the first sort of group, second, we're learning more and more. And um, one of the things, you know, we're always guided by the young people. And I think um, like that feedback from them is critical because sometimes how we think is very different to how they're thinking as well. So I think there's always, like I always say with anything that we do, there's always room for improvement. It's always around, um, you know, how different people identify um, with culture because we're talking about, um, you know, traditional ways of knowing and being, but we're also talking about a very West Western world. And when we're talking about that, we have young people that have been removed from their families or their families have been a part of stolen generations. So then they might not have been nurtured and they're looking. We've had um, young people saying, can we come back? Can we come back and do the program again? And we're saying, why? You know, like, what is it about the program? It's maybe because we've got different age groups that are sitting in there, like our, our and this is my belief and my theory is that, um, now we've got sleep coaches from all different ages. They love the mothering. They love the home cooking. They love somewhere where it's very safe. They come in to where we have, and we have it at different places as well. So we actually have a, our base at Young People Ahead. We actually run the program from this building. It's all about young people. We might go to the bike shed, which is about selectability. And then we might move across to Headspace. And, you know, the other organisations that are there. But within that, we set the room up. The room is set up so when they're coming in, it's like a wow factor. You're seeing, you know, Aboriginal paintings that are very local. We can talk to that. And, you know, and I think that's one of the things, and it's um very heartfelt because it's like anywhere that you move into or if the first time you're being there, you've got to feel like you're welcome. And people have got to open up around that. And, and you know, it's that, always that first contact. And we're the first contact to our young people. Some of them we know, some of them we know the family, some of them we don't know because Mount Isa is a very, very diverse group um, of people that live here. So, you know, around that, yes, the sensitive, all that, it's all a part of that. And, um, you know, I could talk till the cows come to water about this because it is my thing. <laughs> my I thing agree. I do every day. So, yeah, and I but, hope that helped yeah, a little bit. that's great. Sue says, yeah, she loves all this and agrees. Um, and I'm... I'm Great comment from Jen Walsh saying, thank you, Fatima and Rons and team for your work in this area. And I agree it has implications beyond our First Nations people. Can you future gaze and let us know whether you are expecting our current treatments for sleep disorders? Um, will they be broadly applicable in the First Nations community? Uh, what do you reckon about that? What's your yeah, we, we have just started exploring that, mm -hmm. uh, but we also did a pilot study, I think two or three years back, where we only tested the acceptability of um, uh, current questionnaires for sleep apnea diagnosis screening effort. But um, what uh, we realized that the, um, the questionnaire needed significant tweaking. So we use a pictorial version of effort and some of the questions uh, around um, alcohol consumption were uh, raised as uh, culturally inappropriate by community members. So we had to remove that. So um, then the questionnaire looked very different from the current effort. So, uh, and that was only a pilot study, but we also found that there were over 25% who had uh, severe daytime sleepiness so building on that, this current MRFF early and mid-career grant, we're going to explore community preference for sleep apnea diagnosis and management and co-designing a model of care. And again, building on the success of sleep push program, we're going to train local people to become sleep technologies and run sleep apnea level two studies, maybe in community, remote communities where there's a long wait time to go to Townsville or um, uh, Brisbane for initial um, overnight sleep study. Um, I can't uh, can't really tell with confidence whether or not the current uh, sleep apnea diagnostic and management services are going to be very effective. I think some part of that still is important, but we need to adapt it and make it more culturally responsive and embed local ideas and thoughts into developing the tools. Mm. 
uh, for diagnosis as well as training local people to run that service. Because if we rely on external services and we have learned that from COVID that then everything becomes unsustainable. So investing in local capacity building and designing the tools and the service model with the intended end user, I think is going to be the key. Um, still we need to uh, use evidence-based care, we just can't come with a random model. So a lot of the elements of current mm -hmm. service model will be applicable, but with uh, slight tweaking or adaptation, I guess, and that would be covered in the co-design workshop. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, fantastic. I think that's, yeah, there's lots of, lots more, there's so much work, as you said, to be done. So much more work, so much more we'll know. Probably we should get an update every year, really, from you for our, part of our seminar series. Um, and we look forward to hearing a bit more about it too, for those of us who are going to sleep down under in Adelaide in November. Mm -hmm. so I think that we can probably call, yeah, I might just call this to an end. We, we sort of allowed the hour this time. We were experiment, experimenting with different times, like half hour, 45 minutes, an hour. Yeah. And we've got nine. I think we'll just maybe, and there's, I think if there's anything else you want to add, um, otherwise what I'll do is just, um, uh, I wanted to share my screen before we finish up with um, a little plug for us at the Sleep Health Foundation. But most of all, I well, I thank you both very much for such a um, informative, engaging genuine just a, just a really wonderful overview of what you're doing and we I think we can all sense the importance of the work and and how how yeah, how culturally sensitive it is how community led it is and all that sort of stuff that has implications for us to learn for for everything we do even beyond the first nations people to actually be a real center of excellence and role models for for everything that we do so I wanted to just let the audience know that there's the, the, the last one for the year we'll have in late November it's going to be improving sleep in school aged children We've got a couple of paediatricians from the Royal Children's Hospital um, joining me for that. Um, and I also encourage you to go to the QR code on the left if you uh, wanted to just look at our website. We've got a, nearly 100 different fact sheets on a range of topics. You can look at all the other sleep seminars we've had. We've got them all there on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to follow us on our socials as well. So, yeah, so a virtual round of applause for Ros and Fatima. Thank you so much. And um and I just yeah I'll, I'll declare the the webinar um, to take it to an end now. So thanks to everyone for participating and thanks again to our wonderful presenters. Bye thanks for now. For having us, Mora. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.